Hello everybody out there in YouTube land. My name is Levi Clay and I'm back again to bring you another edition of Hero Worship, the series where I get to talk to you about some of the guitar players that have been huge influences on me over the course of my life and yeah, introduce you to what they're all about and give you some recommendations. So as uh, you may have seen, the episode, uh, the original episode of this was on Ron Bumblefoot Thal. And I thought the fun thing about that was that I could create a Spotify playlist containing all of the songs that I talk about. So in this particular instance, you can go into that uh, description below and you will find a link to a Spotify playlist looking at a selection of tunes by Joe Pass that I am a big fan of. So check them out, continue from there, listen to more songs, go and explore, find as much information as you can. I'm sure you're going to enjoy yourself. Anyway, so if the title and the name drop there didn't tell you who we are going to be talking about today, we're going to be talking about the incredible Mr. Joe Pass. Now, I was introduced to Joe Pass uh, around the age of about 15 or 16, a little bit later on. And if memory serves me correct, what happened was I was really into Shred and I picked up one of the Frank Gambale instructional DVDs. Now, you'll have to forgive me, I can't remember which one it was, but I'm sure you can check. If you go and look at, say, Monster Licks and Speed Picking, uh, on the bonus features of the DVD, there was uh, clips from other Alfred instructional videos. And one of them would have been some of the Joe Pass content from the uh, the live uh, Evening with Joe Pass DVD. And it was a performance of, uh, I, th I believe both were on there, both Satin Doll and All the Things You Are. And when I heard All the Things You Are, I was absolutely blown away by it because this was new to me. I'd never heard anything like this. Before that, I was absolutely into the rock and the shred thing. This just seemed so beautiful that someone could create so much music on their own. And that really resonated with me because growing up, I didn't have have the option to go and play with a lot of people because I was very isolated in where I lived. So there weren't any drummers, there were no bass players, there were no people near where I lived. So I uh, really was drawn to the idea of being able to play by myself. Now, when you look at Joe Pass's history, he he obviously had people to play with, but his father drove him to, as Joe would often describe in interviews, always fill in the gaps. So from a young age, his dad picked up on the fact that Joe had quite an ear for music and he encouraged Joe to go out and learn songs and always use his ear, learn things by ear. And you'll hear in interviews Joe talking about his father bringing him in to have uh, have him play songs for uh, his his dad's friends when they were when they would come over. And yeah, like I say, filling in the gaps. So this this style developed from that where Joe would often fill in uh, empty sections of songs with these these long runs, and you just listen to Joe playing solo, and you can kind of see where all of that came from. So yeah, not beginning at too young an age. Really, the interesting thing about Joe is his career didn't pick up until much later on in life. He did play uh, semi-professionally. He was going out and being paid to play gigs. But actually, pre-1962, Joe's life is not all that well documented. In fact, he spent much of the 50s in prison uh, because of various crimes all pertaining to his heroin addiction that he was going through. So after getting himself together from that, he uh, was in some sort of rehabilitation program 
Um, and there, what's the name of the place? I know it's something to do with Synanon. <laughs> um, they are essentially a bunch of the people in this rehabilitation center, the Synanon Rehabilitation. Let's go with that. Uh, in 1962, they put out an album called Sounds of Synanon. Now, to be completely honest, it's not my favorite Joe Pass recording. I don't even think it's a great recording, but <laughs> it is an early example of uh, Joe's playing in a professional setting. Now, from there, he did pick up record deals and would put out several albums over the years. Uh, many of them solo guitar albums, but playing in bands was common too, and he was also a fantastic sideman. So probably most notably working with Ella Fitzgerald on many albums, and we'll talk about one or two of those as I go on. Uh, I highly recommend you check out the Ella Fitzgerald work in fact, I've got a great uh, concert DVD of the, the two of them uh, together. Any live footage of them is well worth checking out. In fact, I mean, this is probably suicide, but I'm going to cut in a clip of Joe playing with Ella now, just a short one, and hope that that doesn't get my video taken down. So, yeah, it sounds like this. What makes me treat you the way that I do? Gee, baby, ain't I? good to you there's nothing in this wide world too good for a boy that's good and true gee baby ain't i good to you i bought you a fur coat for christmas a diamond ring so if you are into seeing how guitar players can accompany a singer, which is probably a little bit less common than, say, a piano player accompanying a singer, uh, Joe is a great example of that. But outside of performing with people like Ella Fitzgerald or Frank Sinatra or the many people that he provided guitar work for, uh, like I say, he was a solo guitarist and he was a band leader. So uh, 1964's For Django is obviously for Django Reinhardt. That's worth checking out. Uh, things really pick up, though, around 1973 when the album Virtuoso came out. So my actual experience of Joe, my first experience of Joe, was seeing that he released an album called Virtuoso. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, the fucking balls on this guy. I like that. The Just the, the punk attitude of calling yourself Virtuoso. Um, that really spoke to a young Levi. It speaks to an older Levi as well, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, so I had to go and check those albums out. And Virtuoso number two was the one, the first one that I got, and it's still my favourite Joe Pass album. But yeah, like I say, 1973's Virtuoso is well worth checking out. Now, a uh, little known fact on that one. I say a little known fact. It, I'm sure this is in the liner notes. When people listen to Virtuoso 1 and Virtuoso 2, they sound very different. And if my memory serves me correct, the reason for that is uh, on Virtuoso number one, they actually lost the, the recordings for the amplified guitar. So what you're essentially hearing on that is a mic'd up electric guitar. So there's a lot of string noise uh, on that recording. Uh, it doesn't give you the, you know, the pure amp tone that you would expect from a guitar recording, but you know, that's fixed by Virtuoso number two. So yeah, Virtuoso, well worth checking out. And you know, when you check out that Spotify playlist, there's a lot of tracks from those albums on there. Um, he also released an album called Seven Come Eleven with Herb Ellis. Now, of course, Herb Ellis, another influential jazz guitar player. That was in 1974. Uh, again, a good album, well worth checking out. Another one would be Portraits of Duke Ellington, released a year later in 1975. Uh, you know, is what you would expect. Some of the music of Duke Ellington, one of the pioneers of the sound of big band swing. Uh, Duke Ellington, very definitely an influence on guys like Joe Pass and of course someone like Martin Taylor, often talking about guys like Duke Ellington. Martin Taylor, also a big influence on me, introduced me to a lot of the music of Duke Ellington, hearing him play songs like Drop Me Off in Harlem. You know, that inspires you to go and check this stuff out. So Virtuoso number two, that's 76. And 76 was also the year that he would release, and I've got the name, uh, here, F Fitzgerald and Pass dot 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 again. So of course they had recorded uh, before this, but that album is uh, is beautiful, and I would recommend you check that one out. Uh, from there, another record. I should point out. I'm not listing off every album that Joe recorded. There are many, many albums that he recorded in between all of these. These are just choice picks, right? These are just ones that you should go and check out. So uh, 79 was I Remember Charlie Parker. Guess what he's playing on that? Music by and inspired by Charlie Parker. And uh, there's a lot of nylon on that, guitar, uh, on that album. Uh, but still, great playing. Well worth checking out. 
um, Chops in 1979. This is a uh, a band album and uh, just some outrageous playing on this one. This the thing with Joe, Joe's playing is he he could absolutely you know cut heads with the best of them, but he's not a fast player. Certainly, I don't think of Joe as being a fast player. But he could if he needed to. I don't think he was a particularly clean fast player. But actually, that's a lot of the appeal with Joe for me. It's almost that punk rock attitude. It's the it's the kicking the door down and just going for it approach. I always lean more towards his solo guitar and blues playing, solo jazz blues playing. That's what really speaks to me. But when he does do the fast thing, it's, it's honest. It's the only way I can describe it. So Chops is worth checking out. Of course, albums just keep coming and coming. 1991's Virtuoso Live is a great album worth checking out. I believe that's, uh, that's in New York. Uh, killer, killer record. Uh, definitely check that one out. I've also, I'm sure I've done a video on YouTube where I talk about the best Christmas guitar albums. Well, Joe Pass did a Christmas album in 1992 called Six String Santa. Um, yeah, if you want a Christmas album and you want some jazz, why not go for that one? Joe Pass's Six String Santa. And then in 1994, he released uh, Roy Clark and Joe Pass play Hank Williams. Again, I'm checking so I don't get the title wrong on that one. And of course, this is with Roy Clark, the jazz, uh, sorry, the country guitar player. So you've got that blend of country and jazz. I'm playing the music of Hank Williams, one of the icons of the, of the cowboy songwriters. So uh, yeah, just not the type of album I ever imagined Joe Pass putting out. But yeah, it is there, it is worth checking out. Of course, Roy Clark, fabulous guitar player. And we stop at that point because uh, unfortunately, nine, that was 1994, that was the last recording that Joe ever ever did. That was the last session that he, he ever did. He passed away of cancer in 1994. <laughs> terrible loss to the guitar world but there's so much more to Joe than his music and this is the really fascinating thing Joe I don't think Joe would have considered himself a teacher although of course he had many students over the years his approach to teaching appeared to be a lot more musical and less academic but I still consider Joe Pass to be one of the important educators of jazz guitar because if you want to buy books, there are tons of Mel Bay published books that Joe, uh, I was going to say wrote, but I imagine it's probably more of a co-wrote situation. The Joe Pass Guitar Method is worth checking out. Um, there, honestly, I, I couldn't even list off the amount of Joe Pass books I have. There, are, I will see books on my shelf and go, I forgot that that one even existed. Um, there's so much that can be learned from Joe from a book perspective. The uh, the so the uh, chord melody book, Joe Pass chord melody solos, it's essential. There's I remember learning the the uh, transcription of Sonny that's in there, and you know, awesome, great introduction to his playing. Uh, outside of the books though, Joe was also there kind of early on in the video guitar instructional uh, field, recording titles for both Hot Licks and uh, REH. Super, super interesting when you think about it, because not too many people made the jump between those two companies. Of course, you've got the Hot Licks stuff produced by Arlen Roth, um, and I love Joe Pass's uh, Hot Licks videos, solo jazz guitar and the blue side of jazz. 
But then the REH videos, you have uh, Jazz Lines is absolutely excellent. And then I, I mentioned it earlier, An Evening with Joe Pass. Uh, you find the content from those books, sorry, from those DVDs was compiled into a book as well, uh, which again, a great source of information. And yeah, ultimately, I, I think that they are essential viewing for anybody that is into uh, jazz guitar and they're wanting to learn the, the way into the music, but without making it too academic. So that's Joe Pass in terms of education. Uh, outside of that, my phone just won't stop buzzing. Outside of that, the thing that really grabbed me about Joe was the guitars, right? So uh, he actually had an Ibanez signature model, the Ibanez JP20. Uh, it's one of those on screen now, and I always wanted one of these guitars, and unfortunately never got one. Uh, it was a bit of a killer when I uh, went over to uh, Joseph Alexander's place for the first time, and uh, went up into his studio, and there, hanging on the wall, was uh, a Ibanez JP20. And uh, I obviously asked if I could give it a go, and it was uh, everything I dreamed it would be. <laughs> uh, having said that, there is there's a lot of talk online about whether or not Joe actually liked that guitar. It's reported that he wasn't actually a big fan of the guitar. I'm not entirely sure if that's the case. Uh, it obviously was a very different guitar. It's only got the one pickup, and it wasn't quite on the neck. It was pulled back a little bit. So maybe that was something Joe was experimenting with. But the thing I find really interesting about Joe is... I never got the impression that he was someone that really gave a shit about tone. <laughs> and maybe that's me jumping the gun, but he talks about it on the uh, on the MI video, the uh, Evening with Joe Pass. Uh, he, at that point in his career, was just DIing into the PA. Like, he, he didn't care about the tone. It was so much more about what he played. Uh, and that spoke a lot to, to a young, uh, young Levi. Uh, so yeah, the Ibanez JP20, of course he played many other guitars, uh, you'll, there's, <laughs> there's a, I'm sure there's a, uh, an image of Joe with a Telecaster, uh, but I certainly remember seeing images of Joe Pass playing, uh, is it a, a Jazzmaster? That would make sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, not that that's a particularly jazzy guitar, but from that early Sounds of Synanon, uh, recording period of his life yeah before he had the money to get himself a nice ES175 which of course he would uh, play a lot later on in his life uh, yeah that's Joe Pass to me it's somebody that you can learn so much from and someone that you can be inspired by both for a single note soloing approach but also just a solo guitar and appreciating harmony and playing lines that sound like chords and getting some of that bebop uh, edge to the things that you're playing without really being all out bebop. Just one of the most incredible players and I highly recommend that you go and check him out. As you will have seen, I've cut in several clips of Joe playing during this uh, during this video and like I said, it's because I, I can't really put any studio recordings in because I'll immediately get my video copyright struck and I don't want that to happen. But of course, you can go to the link in the uh, description and you can check out some of Joe's music on Spotify. Uh, please do let me know in that comment section how you get on with it. So there you go, guys. That's my thoughts on Joe Pass. Big inspiration to me. Uh, one of the biggest. He was the reason that I decided to get really serious about, about learning. He was the reason I started learning about jazz and uh, took my education to the highest level that I possibly could. So, yeah, definitely worth checking out. Uh, lastly, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to some of these people over here. These are some of my supporters over on Patreon.com. They keep videos like this coming to you. So yeah, I'm going to say thank, thank you to them, but you should also say thank you to them because they rock. Without their support, I certainly wouldn't be able to take as much time as I do creating videos like this. So um, yeah, guys, you are absolutely bloody awesome. Thank you so much. If you'd like to check us out on Patreon, uh, join our Facebook-only uh, patron group and get the ins and outs of what's going on behind the scenes, contribute at, uh, with ideas and get involved in transcription challenges and the like, you can check us out by clicking this button up here. You can subscribe by clicking this little button down here and you will see two more videos here and here. Now it probably makes sense if I made one of those a Joe Pass video, right? In fact, I will. I have covered Joe Pass a lot on my channel, so one is one of my videos talking about Joe and playing some Joe stuff, and one is an actual Joe Pass video. Cannot recommend Joe enough. He is an absolute hero, and you guys are heroes for watching this video as far as you have. So much love, and I will see you for another one soon. Laters.